cameras and lenses, right? But I'm actually going to suggest you do something a little different um, than lenses. And the first thing uh, I would love you to get, let me show you my screen. Um, let's see here. Are these five in one reflectors? Now, my, my uh, Facebook friends, you're not going to be able to see this. If you want to see my screen, you'll have to go to the YouTube channel, Hacking Hollywood, and, and check out the video there. I'll try to link uh, a comment with the with the link so you can see the screen and so you can see exactly what I am um, showing off here. But essentially, this is a super cheap device, but it's super, super helpful. So uh, this newer one, I don't really like the newer brand, but it's got crazy good reviews, uh, 3,500 reviews for this five-in-one reflector. And so what this device is, it's foldable, it's collapsible, right? So it can break down into this little bag uh, and what it does is you can use the different sides or the different looks that it has to shape or bounce light differently. Um, this is going to be super helpful for when you're shooting outdoors, right? When you have the sun coming in and you're backlighting your subject or you have some sort of light that's you're trying to shape, essentially. And so having these different options, all, all five of these options in a $20 price tag is, is pretty incredible. And so... A lot of people want to focus on cameras first and lenses and that kind of stuff. Uh, I would say keep shooting on an iPhone, keep shooting on a GoPro. That's actually what I'm using for this one, even though I have a $5,000 camera sitting in um, a Pelican case in the other room. I would suggest spending your money on something like this first. And it's a smaller investment, but it, it can go a long way. And so I still use this $20 reflector. I have multiple of them and we take them on set and we use them for various things. So the white is really good for bouncing light, obviously. So depending on the situation, you want a nice soft, big source to fill in the faces that you see. Black is good as a negative fill, which actually essentially adds contrast. And so if your sunlight is coming and hitting your face, kind of like the screen is hitting my face right now, uh, you would you would you might want to use that negative fill right on the other side of my face, so that you have the bright white coming on one side, and then you can put the other black on this side, and that creates that kind of contrastier look. And that's actually a huge uh, trick that Hollywood lighting technicians use to help light scenes is they take. Uh, so a black fabric and they create a negative fill. So on your key side, the key side is your strongest source of light, right? So that's going to be your, right now this side of my face is the key and this side would be the fill. And so if I had some sort of bounce or reflective thing, I could bring up the fill side uh, with a white bounce or I can use the black to go negative fill, right? To remove some light to make this side contrastier to make that darker. So also on this reflector, you'll see that there is a gold side and a silver side, and then there's another white. Why are there two whites? Well, let's go down the line here. For the gold, um, that particular bounce is really helpful if you're trying to warm the image, right? If you're trying to make it look uh, like a dream sequence, or if you're just trying to add some more color to the person's face, they might be pale. Another helpful uh, use of the gold reflection is with darker complected people, especially uh, African-American people. I found that was a trick that I learned from an African-American DP friend of mine who said, try the gold bounce. It actually kind of gives you this kind of highlight that happens on the skins with that bounce, which is really cool. And the silver side, to be honest, I almost never use that. It's actually kind of too powerful and too cutting. So just keep that in mind when you're using it. And so finally, we're getting down to the very last part of this reflector thing. And so if you take off the case, as you'll see in this picture, the inner core is actually a diffusion. And so what a diffusion does is it softens the light. And so if I put a diffusion in front of my face, um, you won't see harsh shadows. In this particular case, in my uh, YouTube setup that you see right now, the light is actually bouncing off of the ceiling and, and hitting me. And it's at kind of a nice broad angle. So this light is actually pretty nice. You can see the shadow like in my hand that I'm showing you right now. Let me take that full screen. 
the shadow that you see isn't really defined on my chest, right? It's not really defined on my face. It's a nice softer shadow, but if I bring, bring my fingers closer, I know it's kind of hard to see, uh, but you'll see more definition you'll see more definition in the shadows, right? And so when your light's diffused, when it's soft, you'll have less definition in the shadows, but it's actually nicer on skin tones and people's complexions and faces and stuff. They tend to use it as like beauty light, right? So that five and one reflector is doing amazing things for like 20 bucks for you, which is really, really cool. So keep that in mind when you're shopping for stuff. That is a definitely a no brainer. Um, going back to it too, I, I said this just a couple minutes ago, use what you got, whether it's a GoPro or an iPhone or whatever, don't let that get in the way of you creating. Um, if you're able, the most important thing that you can do as a, as a young fil filmmaker is to get the reps in and do as many things as you can and shoot as many projects as you can uh, and multiply your experience. So after you've gotten that reflector, hopefully you'll be able to borrow somebody's camera. Hopefully you'll be able to use something at school or maybe one of your friends or one of the parents has a camera that you can use. So the next step is if, you, if you're borrowing a camera, I would actually invest in lenses or a lens before you do your camera. I know that sounds a little backwards, but if, hey, if you have the money to spend on, on a body, uh, a camera body, I encourage you to do that as well. But I would actually encourage you to first buy a 50 mil prime lens. Now the difference between a zoom lens and a prime lens, a prime is one particular focal distance. So it's a set, uh, it's a set distance. So you can't zoom in and out. The difference though with the prime is it, it's actually higher quality glass, typically speaking. Uh, it's a lot sharper of an image, typically speaking, depending on what lenses you're buying. And the f-stop is lower, meaning more light can be let in through the lens which gives you kind of like that depth of field and what you're used to when you're watching films. So um, depending on what format you like shooting on, if you tend to be a Canon guy, you can get a 50 in Canon in an EF mount. If you are a Sony guy, you can get a 50 mil in the M mount. And if you are a Nikon guy, I believe it's F mount, right? So there's all these different brands and they essentially all do the same thing, right? Uh, so I would encourage you to get a 50 mil that fits the lenses, I'm sorry, it fits the system that you have. And so the 50 mil lens is actually fairly cheap. It's, it's between 100 and $300, depending on what you're looking for and what you're buying. Just a little side note for my own self, I'm trying really hard to not use the word um <laughs> I'm listening to myself, <clears throat> listening back to these videos, and I've noticed some speech things that I do that I'm trying really hard to fix. So if you hear me doing more pauses, it's because I'm intentionally trying to not add those extra filler words in the speech. So, all right, back onto the video. So borrow a camera as long as possible. You know, get that 50 when you got it. The next thing to do is to do audio, right? And so you'll need some sort of recorder. And I'm gonna go ahead and look up something called an H1 Zoom. So I have the big brother to this. Again, it, uh, if you're watching on Facebook, I would encourage you to jump over to YouTube so you can see my screen. But this is a Zoom H1 Handy Recorder. And so what this device does is obviously record sound. Now, the device that you're actually seeing on camera in front of you which is on this screen, right down here in front of you, um, is the H5. So this is the big brother to that smaller device. But when you're first starting out, you don't have tons of money or resources. I mean, you might, but if you didn't, if you didn't, this would be something I would suggest over the H5. This is just a single recorder, so you have the XY st uh, stereo pair of microphones at the top of this unit. And so this is gonna be really good for just basic recordings. On the back side of this device, you have a quarter inch. Let me, let me see if I can play this video without going too crazy here. Let's see. I just wanna see the underside of this thing if it'll let me show you. But essentially that microphone, you get it close to your subject just like I'm doing now and it'll allow you to have better sound quality than what you would have typically on a camera. So 
cameras aren't really designed to have the highest sound quality. They're kind of a minimalistic thing because it's a it's an add-on thing that you have that you pay for essentially as you have more and more gear. That's the the pluses and minuses about being in the film industry is there's always something else to get and always something else to buy. Um, there's a high quality recorder built into this device and you can connect that device directly to your camera with an eighth inch jack or um, an aux cable. So it's, it's a really powerful device and it's got a built in limiter and it's got a low cut filter like it's showing you right now. So it's a really powerful device. So next on the list, let me jump back over to me while I get that pulled up. Let's see. So the next thing I would get is a tripod. And so Manfrotto tends to be a fairly fairly decent tripod uh, at an affordable price. And so I think the one that I, I actually own two of these different Manfrotto tripods. But let me pull up on Amazon and see. I'm an Amazon chopper. I don't know if you personally like or dislike Amazon, but that's the world we're in today, right? So, Manfrotto. Uh, these particular tripods are not very good for video. You can't really do any panning and tilting. This next one doesn't have a ball head, right? And so that would be something you would have to buy separate. This is a mini tripod. So let's skip down to this $300 502 head tripod. This one has um, extending legs and then also at the neck it can extend. So I would actually suggest going with the more expensive one if you can. The main reason is because under the ball head itself I'm getting a warning. Okay. My bit rate's low apparently. Okay. Back to Amazon. There we go. So the main reason is because of the the head here. If I can zoom in on this picture, you can essentially self-level the legs, right? You depending on where you are and what surface you're putting these legs down at, and so you can have the legs on a slant, but still get the ball head level. And on some of the other heads, they don't they don't allow you to bubble level at that point. And so that's that's kind of crucial and that's helpful to kind of keep the camera at an even level essentially while you're working. These legs are gonna be a little heavier duty, which is nice. I also have a smaller version of this tripod and I actually prefer the bigger, heftier, heavier one. Let's see, I believe I have this one. Yeah, so I have this smaller, the smaller one, what is this one called? The 502A. And I also have this bigger one, right? So this 502. So you'll see there's a slight difference in the build quality and that kind of stuff. Like I said, I prefer this bigger stockier one that, that's right here. So that's gonna kind of be at your, your discretion and your preference. There obviously are tons of other brands of stuff, just like with um, cameras, you have different brands of tripods too. So the next on your list, uh, would be the camera body. And so I would encourage you to purchase a used camera. People who, there are a lot of people who experiment with filmmaking and they don't actually commit 100% or, you know, filmmaking, there's tons of gear and people upgrade over time. And so I would encourage you to look at purchasing a camera used instead of brand new. Obviously make sure it works and you have all the kinks worked out and, you know, each camera's got its own quirk, quirks to it too. So. I would encourage you to, to look at used cameras because usually you can get them about 60% of the retail price of the new price typically. And also when you sell the used gear, like if you upgrade and you switch from one camera to the next, if you paid 60% of retail, you could probably sell it back for 50 or 60% of retail too. So it's kind of crazy, but essentially you hit a certain threshold and you hit kind of a an investment point, right, where you've poured into your gear and you spent money on, on your gear and now um, you can essentially allow yourself to level off and, and switch gear by selling your old stuff and getting other new stuff. So. Alright, so the next thing on the list would be an aperture light. So, 
Let me pull up my screen once again and we'll, we'll go find that. Now, Aperture is a brand. This particular light has a kit where it comes with a battery and then it has just a um, basic light by itself. This particular light will not work for you if you're trying to shoot against the sunlight. This is a compact light. It's a fairly cheap light, even though 160 bucks is a lot of money to a lot of people. Uh, but over time, you'll, you'll see that you know, filmmaking gear gets expensive. And so this is a light that I used early on and I still have three of these today that I use for different applications. You can light interviews with this light. You can do a lot of things. And so this particular setup, this this one I'm currently looking at, this uh, 528 does not come with batteries. You can get the, the one with batteries, which is about another hundred bucks more expensive. I would recommend, um, depending on what you're doing, to don't start off with the batteries. You can actually buy them separately as you go on and expand your kit to, to add those batteries as you go. With this softbox though, I would also suggest getting, I'm sorry, with this light, I also suggest getting a softbox, right? And so you can look up, I believe it's gotta be somewhere. There we are, okay, cool. So this. Kramer Diffuse Collapsible Softbox for Aperture. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to this one. So just like we talked about before with the five in one reflector that has a diffusion built in, this diffusion is built specifically for this light. And so this is gonna allow you to have that soft light like you're seeing on my face right now. And that light is, is just gonna be more aesthetically pleasing to skin tones and to uh, people, especially if they have wrinkles or, or big pores and that kind of stuff. So this softbox kind of it's it's kind of hard to work with sometimes to be honest, but it does its job very very well, and it's just Velcro straps on the back and it's lasted for years for me. And and obviously this chick is showing off how you can fold it and strap it, and once you get used to it, it's good. One more final accessory that you might consider getting for this softbox. Now this, this one has it built in. This is called an egg crate. So within the softbox or on the outside of it, you'll see the egg crate, which essentially focuses the light. I guess they're calling it a, a softbox grid. And so this grid allows the light to go to your subject and it isolates them instead of having that light spread out and cover the background and that kind of stuff too. So it's, it's good to use when you're doing interviews and you want the subject to be the primary focus, right? And the background to not be as lit up. So, yes, once you have those basic things, you can get started. You can do interviews, you can do a lot of really cool stuff. And so, obviously, you can shoot sketches and shorts and other things with the gear you have, with the phone you have. You don't necessarily need to spend the money on all these other things. But as you're moving forward in your filmmaking career, you're gonna to wanna to invest in gear. And so that's just part of it, especially if you're doing YouTube or if you're the solo you know, shooter, editor, director, all the things in one kind of person, you're gonna want some sort of gear to kind of push you along and get you going. So I hope this is helpful. If, if I forgot anything that you would suggest for other people to uh, have in their arsenal, especially early on in their career, go ahead and leave a message down below in the comment. I'd love to hear from you. And if you have any other comments, please hit me up. Now let me check my list to see what I'm doing tomorrow. So tomorrow morning I'm gonna be talking about Christian filmmaking in Hollywood, right? And so I am a Christian filmmaker. I haven't worked in the Christian filmmaking genre, but that, but being a Christian in Hollywood, in the filmmaking industry is what I'm gonna be talking about tomorrow. So. Hopefully you'll tune in and we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody.